Dragon Guard, also known as Dragon Dragoon in Japan, is a 2003 PlayStation 2 game developed by Kavia and published by Take-Two Interactive in Europe and Square Enix everywhere else. Square Enix, of course, being the publishers of the Final Fantasy series. The game was originally intended to be a competitor to Ace Combat, a series known for revolutionizing aerial combat in video games. Only, instead of fighter pilots in a modern setting, the game would feature aerial combat with dragons in a medieval setting. Though, as development progressed, they decided to add ground combat, known as Muso combat, which means the game would also be competing with the famous Dynasty Warriors series by Koei Tecmo. Despite competing in different genres and with different franchises, the game had mediocre sales and a lukewarm reception. The game also apparently had many development issues, with the director constantly being asked to change ideas, but was very stubborn and refused to go back on many of them. Despite the sales and reception, Dragon Guard would go on to become a franchise, spanning a sequel, a prequel, manga, novels, and a more successful spin-off series with its own sequels, novels, stage plays, drama CDs, manga, and around a billion crossovers and tie-ins with other games and franchises. I mean, despite only being the main character of one game, look how many games feature 2B as a playable character or costume. Which, to be honest, is very unusual. Most games with the type of reception Drakengard received would normally die off in obscurity. Even games that were more successful commercially or critically have never lived on with such a legacy as Drakengard. Now, it should be mentioned that this is one of the few games I've done a video on that I have no prior attachment to. I've been a long-time fan of the Nier series, but I never played any of the Drakengard games. Mainly because looking at any footage of them made them seem like extremely boring experiences. But since I have probably lost my sanity at this point, I decided to give the first game in the series a try. And it certainly was an experience. Now, normally I would cover the gameplay mechanics, level design, and player progression as I go through the game, but due to how simplistic the gameplay of this game is, I think it's better to get the core mechanics out of the way first. So as said, Drakengard is a mix of two different gameplay styles, Musou-style ground combat and aerial dragon combat. The ground combat missions revolve around you playing as the main character, Kaim, and running around a huge battlefield completing objectives within a time limit. The time limit for most missions being 60 minutes, which seems excessive considering the longest mission in the game lasted only like 30 to 35 minutes. Should also be mentioned that there's no consistency to how long a mission can last. Some can last half an hour, some last around 90 seconds. The objectives mostly consist of taking out specific enemies or enemy types, killing a certain number of enemies, reaching a specific point on the map, or acquiring items from chests. Meanwhile, you defeat hordes of enemies that usually don't put up much challenge or resistance, aside from a few enemy types. This is the general structure for Musou games. Combat is usually very simplistic, but satisfying, as you mow down hundreds of foes effortlessly. And you usually have a variety of characters to pick from that have different movesets and playstyles to spice up combat. Musou games aren't very deep or complex, but that's not really the point of them. They're designed to be easy to pick up and very satisfying, if a little repetitive, to play. And that's where Drakengard utterly drops the ball. This game is super unfun to play for a variety of reasons. First of all, most of the game you only have one character to play as, Kaim. There are three other characters you can play as, but they mostly play the same as Kaim with slightly different animations and super powerful magic attacks. Not to mention that they work more as limited power-ups rather than actual characters, since you can only call them in three times at a level. 
They can be helpful for clearing large areas or by using them as a get out of jail free card if you're low on health, but they don't really spice up gameplay all that much. Now there is 65 different weapons for Kaim to use with different magic attacks for each, and you can have up to 8 weapons on your weapon wheel at any given time, but since the majority of the game is ridiculously easy and since most of the weapons play the same, there isn't much reason to switch to a different one unless you just want to see some new animations. The way combat works in this game is you just keep mashing the square button until everything in the area dies. If you press triangle after some attacks then Kaim will do a special combo attack which mostly helps for crowd control and stunning enemies. However, because of this, the only weapons you would logistically want to use are the most powerful ones, since they are the most effective for clearing the battlefield. This isn't like another Musou game or RPG game, where certain weapons or characters are more effective at certain things than others, leading to you choosing different playstyles. So using weaker weapons has no purpose beyond intrinsic value, and even then a lot of them share animations. Weapons can also be leveled up to increase the damage or extend the current combo, so even when you get a new weapon, they will likely be weaker or not that much more powerful than your current weapon, so there's not even much reason to use them in that instance. For the majority of the game, I used Kaim's default sword since it was my highest level sword, and also it was the most effective one because I could continuously spam the square square triangle combo which blows enemies back and stuns most enemies in the game, even super powerful ones. I only used different weapons when I was bored or needed to get footage of them. Plus, most of the weapons don't feel like they have impact on enemies. Because of how floaty Kaim is with his movements, and because of the shitty sound effects, hitting enemies just isn't satisfying. The only weapon in the game that is satisfying to use is Hamiya's finger, not only because it's a clear reference to the Dragon Slayer from Berserk, but also because every swing causes massive damage and it knocks almost every enemy back a good few feet. Plus the sound effects and slow speed make the sword feel heavy. As soon as I got this sword, I used it for the rest of the game, since it was the most effective and most fun to use. The short draw distance in the maps also means that targets won't appear until you're a few yards away, meaning that you constantly have to be checking the map and the map is dreadful. So the way most maps work in games is that the map stays in the northwest southeast position for up left down and right. Not for Drakengard though. The map shifts depending on what direction Kaim is facing, so getting your bearings can be often very difficult since the map doesn't stay consistent. After a while I started getting a headache from this. Also, the camera just flat out sucks. Whilst there are a few options to fix it, you can never maneuver it in a comfortable way. The default camera just allows you to look left, right or down. You can't turn the camera normally, so in order to change your view, you have to move Kaim in a way that moves him in that direction so the camera now faces that direction. It's dreadful. It slows down the pace of exploration and combat, and it means that during smaller levels it's even harder to fight enemies since some will be in a direction you can't look at. Now there are some ways to fix this. Blocking with whatever sword you have will instantly snap the camera to whatever direction Kaim is facing. Same works with using magic and dodges. Blocking is mostly useless since for weaker enemies you would never need to block and for stronger enemies they can break through the block. Dodging is only helpful a handful of times, since most enemies in the game can be stunlocked to death very easily, and because Kaim is very good with crowd control. The only time you'll really need to use it is when fighting stronger enemies in the late game that can't be stunlocked very easily. But even then, the dodge is pretty cumbersome, since you can only dodge left and right. It's not like most games where you can dodge in any direction you want. It might just be me, but I would honestly rather play Resident Evil with tank controls than ever use the controls of this game ever again. Mostly because with Resident Evil, they're at least consistent and work. Kaim also levels up as the game progresses, which increases stats such as health, damage, and magic power, which allows you to deal with most enemies much quicker. And this does cut down on the tedium of the game a bit, 
but it doesn't stop it from becoming repetitive. And that's the entire ground combat for this game. You just run around to the map, spam in square and occasionally triangle, whilst your kill count racks up to insane numbers. Every single mission is like this. There's very little variation on mission structure in this game. Every mission in the game plays the exact same as the last one, except sometimes the locations are different. If I speed up any of the footage for these missions, you'll see how much of it is me just running around and spamming the same combos. The ground missions got boring for me after two levels, which was about 20 or 30 minutes into the game. I imagine most people will get bored even quicker. But as said, there is another mission type in this game. Aerial combat. The aerial missions are much better than ground combat missions. First of all, some can actually be quite difficult, as you need to maneuver around attacks and dodge multiple projectiles at once. You can shoot regular fireballs or locked on projectiles, and both have benefits. Fireballs do more damage, but have more chance of missing. Lock on does less damage, but fills up your magic gauge quicker. When the magic gauge fills up, you can do a super powerful blast, which will destroy multiple enemies in the surrounding area and cripple the health bars of more powerful enemies. Though I do not know why they made the sound effect for it so bassy and loud. There was one time where I used this attack, and it was so loud it temporarily overloaded the sound files. I will say that unlike the ground combat, your attacks here actually do feel impactful. However, whilst the aerial missions are better, they are still extremely repetitive, as they all have the exact same structure where you go and kill a finite number of enemies, and then fly to a certain point on the map to end the mission. So whilst they're not as bad, they still get extremely repetitive too. Throughout the game, you'll be alternating between these two level types, but since both get repetitive, it doesn't really help break the tedium of the game. But considering the game started out as an aerial combat game, it doesn't surprise me that this portion of the game ended up being the best part. The dragon can level up too, and even gain new forms, but it doesn't really play that much differently. You can also use the dragon in the ground combat missions, which is extremely useful unless guys with arrows are situated around the battlefield, because they can knock you off in a few seconds. There's also a few sections where flying the dragon around can be a bit cumbersome controls-wise. The game also includes free expeditions, which allow you to replay stages which is odd considering the game already has a chapter select feature. You can use these to help level up Kaim or the dragon if they're too low level, but I never had to because apart from a few sections, Drakengard is an extremely easy game. As I said before, most enemies can be stunlocked to death really, really easily. And even then, leveling up wouldn't help all that much because the sections that are difficult, especially some of the bosses, aren't difficult because of stats, they're difficult because of the game mechanics. There is another type of mission called event missions. These are really short missions where you run around with a fixed camera, and are only able to use Kaim's default sword. Some of them have you fight enemies, but most of them just have you run to a certain point. The game could have really done with more variety of objectives and mission structure more variety of combos with the different weapons, more variety with how the different characters play, make the weapons feel more impactful, and just overall make the game less repetitive. Imagine 20 plus hours of you alternating between boring ground combat and mediocre aerial combat. Now, that would be enough to drive anyone playing this game insane, but what would turn them into a psychopath is the soundtrack. Now, most soundtracks in games I've played have either been amazing or just okay. The worst ones have just faded into the background and never really stood out. However, I don't think I've ever played a game where the soundtrack makes the experience worse until Drakengard. The tracks in this game made me think the emulator was broken, but no, that, that's just how they sound. Imagine everything I said before about this game being boring and repetitive for over 20 hours, and imagine all that with these absolute bangers playing over it.
stop it. Stop. Stop! Yeah, if you're, if you're wondering what's with the hiatus between the last video and this one, I was in the mental hospital recovering from this game. Probably gonna have to go back there after I finish this video. Alright, strap yourself in. This one is gonna be a doozy. So the game starts off with the main character, Kaim, trying to save his sister, Furiai, from the Empire. She's currently in a castle known as Castle Bailey, and Kaim needs to fight through hundreds of enemies to save her. So the game starts, and he kills well over 200 people just getting to the castle gate. Five minutes into the game, and he's already a mass murderer. As Kaim enters, he finds a red dragon that is barely alive. Kaim is immediately disturbed by the sight of this being, as Kaim's parents were murdered by a dragon. He goes to kill the dragon, but before he delivers the killing blow, it speaks to him. Kaim realizes that he cannot save his sister on his own, as he's not powerful enough, and the dragon herself is nearly dead, and both of them have a strong will to live. So they reluctantly agree to a pact where both of their souls are joined together. Should be mentioned that this is an early 2000s Japanese game, so the English voice acting is... Kill me if you desire, but you can never dirty my soul, wretched human. Tell me, do you still want to live, dragon? What? A pact! There's no other way! <gasps> what makes you worthy of a pact with me? Worthy or not, I wish to live. Despise me if you will, but I shall not die! Your answer! A pact or death! Well, not great. But it's also not the worst I've heard. I actually do like the basic premise for the relationship between these two, as they clearly have feelings of hatred for the other, but they can also no longer exist without the other. Which can lead to a lot of interesting conflict between the two. It kind of reminds me of the bond between Talion and Celebrimbor in Monolith's Middle Earth games. Both of them clearly have contrasting views on a lot of subjects, but they also need each other to survive. The problem, however, is that immediately after making this pact, Kaim is made mute. In this universe, in order to create a pact between a human and another creature, the human must sacrifice something, and for Kaim, it was the ability to speak. His tongue is also branded to show that he's mute. This isn't a problem for Kaim and the dragon, though, because they can communicate via thoughts and she can speak for him. But this does mean that Kaim's character has to be entirely told through body language and thoughts, rather than dialogue, since he never speaks in the game again. Aside from one moment. The dragon also explains that since their souls are bound together, if one of them dies, they both die. Kaim and the red dragon then venture to the sky to take out enemy air reinforcements. They also do one last mop-up of the ground forces before moving into the castle where Kaim commits more mass murder as he climbs the structure. When he reaches the top, his dear friend Inuart is already saving Furiai. Luckily, the both of them manage to save her, with Kaim really going to town on one of the corpses. Kaim then reveals to them that he can no longer speak, and due to the attack on the castle, Inuart decides to move Furiai to the elf village, where she will be much safer. Before they depart, however, Inuart decides to play his harp to celebrate them being alive, I guess. This is also where chapter 1 closes off, and story-wise, it's actually not a bad start to the game, as the game immediately showcases a potentially interesting relationship between the two main characters and the consequences of their will to live, that being their individuality. The three head to the village, only to find it under attack. The dragon warns Inuart to find somewhere else to take Furiai, but Inuart is stubborn and insists on going to the village. So, because this dumbass is so stubborn, the next couple of levels are spent clearing the village of enemies, only to reach it and realize that it's already been destroyed. I hate you, Inuart. Though the dragon detects the voice of another packed user, Verdele. Verdele recommends that Furiai stay with him for her safety. 
Kaim and the Red Dragon stay behind to investigate the village further whilst Inuart takes Furiai to Verdile. During their investigation, they find writing in blood that tells of the Watchers. Speak not the Watchers. Draw not the Watchers. Write not the Watchers. Sculpt not the Watchers. Sing not the Watchers. Call not the Watchers name. What is this? They also find a woman who is just barely alive, and she says that the Watchers took the elves to the shrine. The dragon asks what exactly the Watchers are, but the woman passes away before she can give an answer. Well, at least we got a destination, so let's go. You may have noticed that the cutscenes in the game are done in a very weird way. They're a mix of the text box style cutscenes that many JRPG games use, and fully animated cutscenes. You do occasionally get pre-rendered cutscenes, but for most of the game, this will be how you experience the story. Because of this, it means most cutscenes are visually uninteresting, because you're viewing all of the characters' actions from 50 feet away whilst they just do simplistic animations. The game does try to show their facial expressions in these animated boxes on the left, but they don't animate much anywhere. The CG cutscenes have far more interesting cinematography, and because the characters have actual facial expressions, it's much more entertaining to watch than this. Also, the dialogue during most cutscenes is very boring, because it mostly just consists of the Red Dragon explaining what the next objective is. And because of this, we don't really get a chance to flesh out the characters or the world, and so it becomes much harder to get attached to the story. As we progress to the shrine, we find that the elves are not here and were taken someplace else. Gotta stretch out the game somehow. A resident of the 38th Valley comes in and asks Kaim for help, but Kaim kicks him aside and heads on his way. One thing the game does a pretty good job showing is that Kaim is not a good person. He's a bloodthirsty maniac who just wants to kill as many people as he can, and has no interest in anything besides that. The only reason he's helping Ferdi is because she's his sister. So anything that doesn't benefit him is pointless, and he doesn't care for it. It's a break from the usual fantasy video game protagonist, who is a kind soul always trying to do their best for others. Kaim could not care less. As Kaim and the dragon progress further, they hear the voice of another Pact user, Leonard. A man who attempts to commit suicide outside his burning house, where his younger siblings lie dead. He feels guilty that he was the one to live, whilst his family burned. Now, this might make you feel bad for him, until you find out the reason as to why he survived, and his siblings died. The reason why he survived is because he was not at the house when it was being burned. Now, why was he not at the house? It's because he was masturbating in the forest. Turns out that Leonard is a pedophile and has a fetish for young boys so he decided to pleasure himself to it out in the forest, only to return and find his siblings dead. This is only hinted towards in the western release of the game, but the Japanese version is pretty explicit with it. Apparently more scenes with Leonard were planned, but were cut after heavy pushback from the developers. The developers said that they wanted Leonard to have the theme of guilt lying over his head, a character that did horrific things and hates himself for it, to the point of wishing to be dead. He realizes how bad of a person he is for the fetish he has, and he wants nothing more than to be punished for it. So, having someone who has that self-realization makes for an interesting conflict, especially when he's too much of a coward to kill himself. It could work as an interesting dilemma, but it's not explored much in the game beyond this chapter and his side mission. He eventually makes a pact with an elf who has a super annoying voice. You're scared? Dying is good! You don't want to die? Really? No! What a bore! Seriously, finish yourself off! Oh, hold on! Of course! Let's make a pact! What do you... mean? You don't get it? Hello? Is that skull as hollow as a helmet? Funny enough, this elf is voiced by Wendy Lee, the voice of Faye Valentine from Cowboy Bebop. Anyway, the price for his pact was his eyes, so he's now blind. He decides to join Kaim on his quest, and you can also select him as a playable character. I 
don't think I've ever experienced a video game that has a playable pedophile, and I don't believe I want to experience another one, thank you very much. There is also a side mission with Leonard where you go around murdering undead child soldiers, but nothing really happens story-wise in this mission. It's mostly just an extra series of levels that fleshes out Leonard a little bit, showing that the relationship with his pact is different to Kaim's. The elf keeps tormenting Leonardo for his actions, and how much of a coward he is. Chapter 2 of this game just... sucks. Nothing really happens in it. There is some mystery as to who the Watchers are, and it introduces a character with a very uncomfortable personal conflict, but the chapter just drags on for far too long considering how little story actually occurs. And I wouldn't have minded this if the game was fun to play, but... Oh, fucking stop it already, seriously. Chapter 3 starts with Kaim meeting up with Furiai, who says that Verdile has been kidnapped as well as Inuat, and that Kaim has to save them. I will be safe. I am a goddess after all. Okay, if she'll be safe, why does she need someone to protect her on her journey? Also, fun fact, Furiai is voiced by Kari Walgren, who you may know as the voice of Haruko in Fooly Cooly, Saber and Fate, or Lady from Devil May Cry 3. The odd thing is that both Kaim and Inuat are voiced by Fleet Cooper. Not that you'd probably notice, since Kaim can't speak. It's also odd, considering the Japanese version has different voice actors for both. Also, since the game doesn't do the best job explaining it, Furiai is a goddess who holds the power of time, space, and different dimensions, known as the Great Time. Whilst it is extremely powerful, it's also considered a great burden. Every time a goddess dies, a new one takes her place, Furiai being the 13th. The reason it's considered a burden beyond holding the power itself is also the fact that goddesses are not allowed to interact with anyone unless their survival depends on it so they can never marry or have children, for example. All of this stops them from leading a normal life. The dragon also comments about how she senses strong feelings coming from Furiai about Kaim. Okay, so we're barely three chapters into the game, and we have child murder, pedophilia, and incestuous unrequited love. What will come next? The next few missions focus on Kaim saving Verdile. When Kaim meets him, he says that the Empire's plan is to obtain the seals. The seals are elements that keep the world from plunging into chaos, and the Empire wants the seeds of resurrection that will appear when all four seals are broken. Since Furiai is tied to the seals, that means they want her dead too. Verdile and Kaim try to protect the desert seal, but it is eventually broken. They then head back to camp to figure out the next move and find Inuart's harp, but no sign of Inuart himself. The Red Dragon then detects another pact user nearby and Kaim and Verdile investigate. Not before this cutscene with the worst British accents I've heard plays. <laughs> No matter how much I hear it, I can't avoid that voice. Is that so? I've grown fond of it, I have. <laughs> Long as it's a woman, huh? You're the only one liking an elf like that. Have you seen her eyes? Pretty scary if you ask me. Even when she smiles, they're dead. Me, I feel sorry for her. Better for her if she had died with the rest of her family. Sorry, mate. Didn't quite get that. I was too busy fingering your nan with a bad Wiimote. Anyway, they find a prisoner named Arioch, an elf who made a pact with Undyne and Salamander, being the powers of water and fire. The price for her pact was her womb, however, preventing her from conceiving children. When told that there is no children surrounding the area, she immediately tries to devour Kaim. Luckily, Verdele is able to put a spell on her to keep her in check. Even though she is a cannibal, they decide to take her with her in order to stop her from harming anyone else. With the desert seal broken, the only seals left are Furiai 
and the Ocean Temple Seal. Arioch has a side mission where you go to the Ocean Temple and destroy a bunch of enemy ships that have child elves on board. Arioch and Leonard beg not to destroy the ships, but the dragon's priority is the seal. So we commit child murder and move on. Just afterwards, Leonard smells blood and finds Arioch eating the corpses of children. According to Undyne and Salamander, Arioch had children of her own, but the Empire murdered them. Due to this event, she went insane and started eating children. What the fuck is this game? I f so, our main cast of characters includes a bloodthirsty maniac who is completely okay with child murder, a blind pedophile, and a woman who cannibalizes children. I, I feel like I need to take a shower after playing this game. I feel filthy. We... We reach the temple, but lo and behold, the seal is broken. Big surprise. So now the only seal left is Fudiai herself. Inuart is shown being held captive as a voice speaks to him. He wants to protect Fudiai, but doesn't have the power to do it, and he doesn't want Kaim to steal her away from him. The voice also promises that there is a way to break the burden of Fudiai being a goddess. So, the next time we see him, He's made a pact with a dragon more powerful than Kaim's, and he also has red eyes now. He steals Fudiai and almost kills the red dragon before Kaim is able to stop him. The next series of missions is just a bunch of random battlefields that the player fights in. There is a new character that joins the squad, being Sere. Oh fuck, I don't feel comfortable with a child being around these chuckle fucks. Get away! Now! Sere's mother recently died, and just afterwards, he made a pact with a golem. The price for his pact being time. He can never age now. Because of this, the red dragon tells him that he will always be alone as a child, but he insists that golem will always be there for him. Also, as a fun fact for you, Sere is voiced by Mona Marshall, who also voices the red dragon. You'll go to the place where the cult is? Take me! Take me too! They took my sister! Golem, you made a pact with this child? Sere also has a side mission. Sere wants to search for his sister who went missing, and of course, Kaim and the Red Dragon do not care. The only reason they go looking for her is because she could be a clue as to who slash where the Watchers are. In this search, Sere is taken captive, and Kaim and the rest of the group must save him. Sere reveals that he feels bad for his sister, because his mother only loved him and never her, and apparently she abused her quite a bit. As such, he has guilt for the way she was treated and wants to save her and be with her. He then apologizes for wasting the group's time and they head on. And that's all the side missions in this game. Leonard's doesn't really add much, since the western version of the game senses his character anyway. Arioch's gives more insight into what drove a woman this mad, but it's really short and doesn't flesh out the character enough beyond basic understanding. Sede's is okay, but everything about his character is in the main story anyway, so you don't really gain anything from playing the side mission. They do add a few extra levels onto the game, but the game is fucking horrible, so... Actually, why did I torture myself playing this game? I could have stopped. What's wrong with me? Chapter 4 has very little story progression other than Sede's side story, so this actually might be the most boring part of the whole experience. There doesn't need to be plot points every five minutes, but the plot should still be moving along with every footstep we take. Yet, there's a lot of missions in this game that are completely arbitrary as the battles themselves have nothing to do with what's going on in the plot, and not much even happens in them. Luckily, Chapter 4 is quite short. Anyway, Chapter 5 starts off with the final push from the Empire. The last battle that will determine their victory or failure. This is the biggest map in the entire game with the highest number of enemies, and I'll be honest and say that the actual premise of this battle is pretty epic. Flying around, bombarding archers, and slaying thousands of troops is pretty satisfying in concept, but it's Drakengard, so it sucks. 
Kaim and the Union Army win, of course, but just as they win, meteors come down from the sky and nuke the entire battlefield, killing everyone. I wish he fucking died already so I could get this game over and done with, but the tooth theory never delivers on my wishes. Apparently, all of this chaos is due to the seals being broken, which means something has happened to Furio. The next two levels then revolve around killing a bunch of ground and aerial enemies before Kaim and the Red Dragon notice a fortress in the sky, but they can't reach it, however, because the wind's too strong. Chapter 6 starts off with a cutscene showing how Inuart has gone so mad with his love for Furiai that he no longer recognizes her. Despite this, he still battles Kaim for her. It's also revealed that the voice inside Inuart's head is actually Sede's sister, Mana. Kaim then has a really crappy boss fight with Inuart. His attacks are super easy to dodge. Kaim then uses Inuart's wind current to fly to the Sky Fortress. The problem here is that Kaim and Inuart are supposed to be friends turned into rivals, yet because we didn't spend much time with Inuart before his descent into madness, this rivalry doesn't really have much value. Especially when Kaim is a silent protagonist for 95% of the game, so he can't have any input in this conflict anyway. Which is the most interesting part of rivalries and stories. You get to understand the type of relationship the two characters have and what separates them, whether it be ideals or opposing goals. Inuart's goals are explained thoroughly, and the game does a good job showing how his desires eventually come to corrupt him, but Kaim's just a silent maniac, and that's it. It's a one-sided rivalry in terms of writing, and that's why it's super uninteresting. Kaim then makes his way inside the fortress and battles his way to Furiai, only to find his sister dead. Good job, mate. Inuart also finds Furiai dead, and the Red Eye curse breaks, but it's too late. Now, I don't laugh at games often, so believe me when I said that this scene killed me. Did I kill you? La 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 Watchers dance! Such fun! The Watchers dance! La 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 The Watchers, they dance! Mana spinning around at mock speed in a T-pose, singing, whilst Inuart screams his head off is just... I don't know why I find it so funny, it just is. Anyway, Inuart leaves the fortress with Furiai's corpse as he hopes to find a way to bring her back to life using the Seeds of Resurrection. However, the Seeds only bring evil upon the world, so Kaim has to stop him. Kaim then battles Inuart again because the boss didn't suck enough the first time, and then he heads to a destroyed city as he and the Red Dragon battle many aerial foes and eventually a worm. This boss fucking sucks. He has three phases that he constantly switches between. Two of those phases make him immune to damage until they're over. Not to mention that there are so many projectiles that it makes it almost impossible to dodge at any given time. There's a delay between each dodge and you can't spam it, so you're likely to get hit by projectiles even if you dodge. It's stupid. It's dumb. I hate it. The entire game has been easy up until this point, but now the game throws a bullshit boss at you with a really stupid moveset. The game does have some character development, though, with the dragon, as she does claim to have grown an affinity for Kaim, and is surprised to feel anything other than utter hatred towards a human. Kaim then makes his way through the city until he ends up in the capital, and the game locks you in a room and has you fight enemies for 15 minutes straight, whilst Mana does a T-pose dance. Anyway, Kaim eventually deals with all the enemies and confronts Mana, but is stopped by Verdele, who refuses to let Kaim murder a child. He instead decides to use a spell to contain her, only it doesn't work, and it only causes her to grow in size and power. So, the final boss of the game is Kaim and the Red Dragon, fighting a giant mana. Surprisingly, this boss isn't actually that bad. The only annoying part is the window of opportunity to attack during the first phase isn't very big, which can lead to the player missing their chance to attack and prolonging the fight needlessly. During her second phase, she starts shooting out these pink rings that the player has to dodge, and this adds more challenge to the fight at the expense of mana's defense. 
which makes the fight more entertaining to play. Towards the end of the fight though, the rings turn into complete madness. Holy shit, my eyes hurt just looking at the footage. Anyway, Mana is defeated and returns to her normal size. Mana then wishes to be killed to appease her mother, but all three characters refuse, stating that her punishment will be that she will always live and be hated by the world and everyone else around her. However, even with Mana defeated, there is no goddess to keep the world in check, and so they quickly need to find a new one. The Red Dragon decides that she will take on the burden as she is more powerful than any human and thus is the most applicable candidate. Both Kaim and Verdelay approve of her decision to sacrifice herself for humanity, and Kaim hugs her as she becomes the new goddess. She also tells him her real name. Angelus. My name is Angelus. You are the first and the last of your kind to know my name. And so, the game ends with the world being saved, and humanity being given another chance to continue. Drakengard's story is nothing special, to be honest. It's mostly a saving the damsel in distress story that turns into a saving the world story halfway through. The characters are interesting conceptually, but not much is really done to flesh them out, beyond a basic understanding of who they are. And the plot is dragged out by pointless and boring chapters that slog along with its terrible gameplay. When I reached the ending of this game, I felt relief more than satisfaction, simply because it meant I would never need to play this game again. I'll be honest and say that I didn't hate every second of the game that I played, but I also didn't enjoy it very much either, and I'm probably making the game seem worse than it actually is. This isn't a broken or dysfunctional game, it's just a very boring game most of the time, so I was glad when it was over. Except... This isn't really the end of the game. This is ending A. Drakengard has five endings. A, B, C, D, and E. Now, in most games, getting alternate endings revolves around the choices the player makes and their way of playing through the game. This isn't the case with Drakengard. To get the other endings, you continue to play the game. New chapters unlock each time you beat the game, and they show different scenarios that occurred leading to different endings. Basically, the game is encouraging you to replay the game to see different events, which is actually a really cool idea. But I... I didn't really like playing through Route A, so... I decided to torture myself and get all five endings, and... This is where my sanity left me. So for Route B, you once again fight Inuart. Only this time, you beat him in a time limit. They... They really got some mileage out of this boss. Kaim then returns to the city to fight some more aerial enemies before going to the ground to find Inuart. Kaim finds Inuart trying to use the Seeds of Resurrection to bring Furiae back to life, and we then fight him again. For fuck's sake, Kavia! Stop using this boss. Inuart then tries to resurrect Furiae, and... it actually works. Furiae, you have returned to me. Only now she's an evil being with magical powers. As said, the Seeds of Resurrection bring nothing good to the world. The game says that Inuart refuses to give up his pride, and that's why he does all this despite knowing nothing good will come of it. Kaim and Angelus then fight this powerful version of his sister, and this is the hardest fight in the game, excluding Route E. A lot of her attacks require the player to move in ways they've never had to in the game up to this point. It's a really difficult boss, but unlike the worm, it's not really unfair. It just requires good positioning with the controls. Anyway, Kaim then defeats Furiae and holds her corpse in his hands. 
However, the seeds of resurrection spawned endless copies of Furiae that are now unleashed onto the world, causing the destruction of mankind. It's a very bleak ending to the game, but it also shows how devoted Inuart was to his cause. He was willing to cause the destruction of the world just to see Furiae alive again. Fucking simp. In Route C, Mana is devoured by a dragon, and Angelus then reveals that the dragons are waging a war against mankind. So the pact between both Kaim and her is broken, and then we have a boss fight against Angelus. Also, Kaim gets his voice back. I am Kaim! It's a really crappy boss, to be honest. You just keep running back and forth from one end to the room when Angelus moves, and then attack her, and that's it. Angelus also apologizes to Kaim for doing this, and she seems to be fighting him out of obligation, rather than wanting to. Probably because if she refuses to take part in the war, she'll be killed too. And the game makes it clear from the start that both her and Kaim have a strong will to live, but neither of them can coexist with this context. Kaim then beats Angelus and decides to wage a one-man war against the other dragons, and then the game ends. Oh, for, come on, that's actually a cool premise. I'd love to see this dude battling hundreds of dragons. Though he probably wouldn't survive, to be honest. Route D has Sede try and talk Mana out of the Cult of the Watchers, but she bonks him on the head and then refuses. So he orders Gollum to kill her. This, however, unleashes the Grotesqueries and the Queen Beast upon the world. The Queen Beast then starts devouring all time and space. Out of options, Sede decides to sacrifice his Pact of Time to freeze the Queen Beast. Hey, hey, Leonard, get the fuck away from that kid. Arioch and Leonard then get devoured by the Grotesqueries, which buys time for Kaim, Angelus, and Sede. Kaim and Angelus then fly Sede to the Queen Beast, and he leaps onto the beast as Kaim and Angelus die. Luckily, though, Sede is able to use his power to freeze the beast, hoping that Mana will forgive him for doing this. The plan is successful, and a huge structure encasing the beast is created, so big that it extends to space. This is actually my favorite ending in the game, since it's the most fitting for all the characters. Kaim, Leonard, and Arioch are terrible people, and I don't believe they deserve a happy ending like they get in ending A. So as punishment, they pay with their lives to save the world, with Sere being the only one left alive, since he's the only character who deserves a happy ending. So I actually like this ending quite a lot, and I love the ominous last shot of the structure sticking out into space as the game fades out. This isn't the canonical ending, since ending A is what leads to Drakengard 2, and ending E leads to Nier. But I would definitely say that ending D is the most fitting ending for this game. But of course, there is one last ending. So, if playing through this entire game with the repetitive and boring combat and the headache-inducing soundtrack wasn't enough to drive someone insane, in order to get Ending E of Drakengard, you need to collect all 65 weapons in the game. Now, that in of itself takes time, but some of the conditions to get these weapons are fucking ridiculous. Some of the levels require you to wait 25 minutes before the weapon spawns. Others have you play through the level and then walk backwards or kill specific enemies at specific points on the map, or even just have it hidden in a really small area of this giant fucking map. It's really, really silly, and I have no idea how anyone figured this out. This took me a good few hours, even with a guide. So after all of that, what do you get? Instead of Sere sacrificing his power to save the world, Kaim and Angelus decide to fight the beast themselves, flying straight into it. This ends up transporting Kaim and Angelus to 2003 Tokyo, Japan. The Queen Beast then falls and rests in the city, and this is where the final boss of the game occurs. The final boss of Drakengard is a rhythm game where the queen tries to play a song and you need to hit the notes back at the same frequency to cancel out the song. Square does white, triangle does black. 
You can spam and cue the notes, but if you hit the wrong one, then it will cancel out your other notes, so you can't just go willy-nilly spamming buttons. And you die in one hit if one of the notes hits you. Now, the first two phases of this boss aren't too bad. It's, you know, fairly easy to see the pattern of notes and which ones you need to hit. But then you get to the third phase. <laughs> There are actually two ways you can make this boss much easier, though. One, crystal meth. Two, you can pause the game and then see the incoming notes and do the correct pattern. This is still pretty difficult since during the third phase, one wrong input and you're dead, but it does make it at least a little bit more manageable. Even so, this boss is super difficult, unless you're a guitar hero player, because then you should have no issue. Kaim and Angelus then defeat the Queen Beast, and it crumbles to the ground. Before they can celebrate their victory, fighter jets come in and shoot Kaim and Angelus down with a missile. And then the game rolls credits. This ending was apparently added in the last stages of development as a joke reference to the end of Evangelion. Anyway, beating this boss unlocks a stage in Tokyo where you can fight the jets, and if you beat them, you get to pilot a jet yourself. This is also the ending that leads to the Nier series being created. Now, Nier is actually a spin-off of Drakengard, yet it became more popular than Drakengard. Not that that's an uncommon thing. I won't get into Nier right now, since I'll do a video on it at some point, but the plot of that game revolves around a disease known as the White Chlorination Syndrome being unleashed upon the world, which slowly causes the extinction of mankind due to it being incurable. That disease was created by the destruction of the Queen Beast that you fight at the end of Drakengard. So the Nia series, which has become fairly successful in recent years, only exists because of a joke reference ending in an obscure PlayStation 2 video game that almost didn't even make it into the game. What a fucking timeline we live in. And what a way to end this game. Drakengard is a boring, repetitive, slog of a game to play, and I did not enjoy the game very much. But I also don't regret playing it, or the time I spent with it. I was always interested to see just how much weirder or how much stupider this game could get. And I also have respect for it trying to stand out against other fantasy games by having a cast of characters that are genuine scum of the earth. I do think they could have done more with this character dynamic, since there isn't really much scenes of the characters interacting much at all. But the characters are pretty memorable, even if they're only memorable because of how despicable they are. It's a very weird game, but that doesn't surprise me considering who the director is. Most people know Yoko Taro as a meme, being that guy who wears the funny Emil mask, or the guy who constantly talks about how much he loves beer, and sausages, and women, or the guy who does puppet interviews, or asks for hentai of Tubi to be sent to him. Most people know him as a very wacky guy, and he is. I'm no therapist or psychologist, so don't take my word for it, but he does seem like a guy with a few loose screws. But, the more you delve into Mr. Taro and who he is, the more you understand his thought process and why the games he's worked on are the way they are. And the more I think about the comments he makes, the more I understand why Drakengard is the type of game it is. First of all, Taro doesn't view story or gameplay as the most important parts in any games he works on. What he views as the most important factor is the emotional effect the game has on the player. Taro said that the characters of Drakengard were inspired by a trend he saw in gaming, that being the act of killing. 
ってことは何だろうってことを考えて当時の他のゲームとかいっぱい見てたんですけれど100人敵を倒しましたみたいな100人突破撃破みたいなことすごいあの自慢げに言うんですねでちょっと冷静に考えると100人人を殺してあの自慢するっていうのはちょっとあの僕正直感性としておかしいなと思ってあの殺人鬼ですよね 100, 100人殺したら、まあ、その狂気の沙汰だって思ったんですよだから He says the reason why the cast of Drakengard is full of insane, unjust, and just flat out wrong individuals is to highlight the violent acts that many characters commit in video games that is never really acknowledged by the game, the developers, or the players. Obviously, there are games in the modern climate, especially in the indie scene, that tackle this subject matter, but this was back in 2003. The only game I can think of before this that acknowledges the player's actions is Metal Gear Solid. So, why are you here then? Why do you continue to follow your orders while your superiors betray you? Why did you come here? <clears throat> well, I'll tell you then. You enjoy all the killing. That's why. What? Are you denying it? Haven't you already killed most of my comrades? If you can list any more before Dragon Guard, let me know. I'm interested. The idea here is that if we make you commit the same actions as any other fantasy game character, but through the eyes of a complete degenerate maniac, then maybe it would change the perception of how killing in games is viewed. Not by shouting to you that killing is bad or something like that, but by providing a different perspective to the violence. Why do you make. Why do you only make these dark and insane games? So I get this a lot, but I'm just not really aware of it. Maybe a little crazy? But there is a reason why、um, you meet a bunch of crazy characters, <laughs> maybe in my game. I just can't imagine for someone to go back to their normal life and self、uh, as if nothing happened after killing hundreds of people. Like, to me, I think stories with a happy ending where the guy runs back to his girlfriend and he kisses her and hugs her after a bloodbath battle is just kind of dark and crazy. I think that's weird. Taro himself has pointed out that violence is very dominant in the market. Look how many games involve you fighting someone or killing someone. Sure, there are games without such features, but the majority of games, especially high profile ones, involve violence of some kind. Yet, despite that, very few of these games will pay two seconds of thought to the actions of the player, or make them question the killing they've committed. He's even said that this can act as a restriction for some game developers who want to make a different type of game, but are forced to make a game with some kind of violence in order to appeal to a broader audience. This isn't to say that violence in video games shouldn't exist or is a bad thing, more so that it's just not called into question enough. And not enough games make you think about it. And that's what Mr. Taro and Kavya wanted to change with Drakengard. Taro has always pointed to the idea of the invisible wall, which he explains in this clip. As with film and novels, slices of culture that have matured, perhaps we're also entering a blind alley. But I want to fight that. I want to strongly believe that there's still a huge potential for games. Take a look at this. It's a very simple image here. This shows the potential games. So, on the outside, you have things you just can't do. So, this refers to things such as expressions that are not allowed、um, ethically or simply unattainable due to costs. For example, there's a limit as to how far we can go with sexual expressions, and I will never have a chance to work on a game that costs $100 million. And then the inside here covers things that are possible with games. So then, are we doing everything we possibly can? In other words, in between things you can and can't do, there exists a gray and fuzzy zone where you're unsure if you can do it, the unknown territory. It's been quite some time since our industry started. Within the cost and time allowed, we are making games intelligently, and at the same time, certain sort of rules and standards have been set in place. Games must be played for a certain amount of hours, or gameplay needs to be fun, or story needs to move people. Rules like these. And we call this the invisible wall. 
The invisible wall only covers the potential games and doesn't allow for anything else. But is this really too? true? Isn't there more we can do? For example, let's say there's a full price box game that lasts 10 minutes. No one would never approve this, but what if, what if those 10 minutes were the most beautiful 10 minutes you, you can experience here on Earth? Or another example, a game no human can clear. Can that not exist? Just thinking about these things, these ideas, make my heart beat. I sense that there must be a lot of emotional peaks that are possible on the other side of that invisible wall. So entertaining story, fun game system, these already exist in this world. The thing I'm most interested in is, is this gray zone. I want to see what's beyond that wall. Whatever or however you want to call it, it's the space where no one has entered yet. It doesn't have to be all positive things or emotions or experiences. It's the kind of experience that will make an adult want to pick up a game at the game store. It's the kind of emotion you get when an adult is so frustrated and throws his controller. An experience you can't really review or evaluate on Metacritic. This is because these exact reasons is, because, uh, is why I fell in love with games in the first place. The idea being that there are many things video games are probably capable of doing as a medium, but we may never know due to some ideas being left unexplored. Over the past 50 years that video games have existed, standards have been developed as to what a video game should be. Now, because of these standards, they do allow for more high quality games nowadays, but it also means less innovation nowadays, since we've built a wall and a list of restrictions as to what a video game should be. He's presented the idea that video games may stagnate if they only stay within the usual parameters, or maybe that we've even hit a stage of stagnation in the gaming industry. But he still wants to try and push the limit, and with each game he works on, the limit keeps getting pushed further, with Nier Automata being the biggest example. And that's why games like Drakengard or Nier gained such a cult following. There's games with better combat, better graphics, and even better stories. But there's very few games, especially in the AAA scene, that push the limit the way these games do. So, despite how much I didn't enjoy Drakengard, I still have a lot of respect for it. It's Taro and Kavya's first attempt at trying to push the limit, by changing the perspective of violence and killing in video games. And considering how many games contain such topics, it can change the way you view video games as a whole. And that I commend. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe, ring the bell, all the usual stuff. I do apologize for the long hiatuses between videos, Lately I have been struggling with motivation in regards to working on projects, though it is slowly coming back, so expect videos a bit more frequently. Until then, I'll see you in the next video. You know, I found out during the making of this video that during development, they used two placeholder models for Kaim. One being this really funny cat, and the other being Neo from the Matrix? I have no idea why. I don't even know where they got this model from. Because this was before Enter the Matrix and Path of Neo. I don't know why they thought a funny cat and a character from a cyberpunk movie fit a placeholder model for a medieval fantasy setting, but sure. I mean, this to me is more interesting than anything that happened in Resurrections.